Good morning. I'm Jeff Mack at the Corning Museum of Glass, and welcome to this edition of CMOG's Bringing the Heat live stream series. For my demonstration today, instead of making an original design, I'd like to create an interpretation of a very special piece that resides right here in CMOG's 35 Centuries of Glass Gallery. This goblet was made on the island of Murano by Giuseppe Barovier in the 1880s. It's one of several that Barovier would make in his long and storied career. At the time when this was made, Murano's glass industry had just experienced an incredible resurgence in creativity and production after nearly disappearing completely because of the socio-political pressures and restrictions which limited their activity earlier in the century. During this resurgence, the artisans of Murano devoted much of their attention to the challenge of rediscovering ideas and techniques of the past. At one point in 1875, an art dealer from Venice named Michelangelo Guggenheim presented the glassmakers of Murano with a selection of intricate antique pieces to copy, which were displayed in the museum for all to see. One of these pieces in particular grabbed the attention of the island's glassmakers for its elegant design and technical challenges. From this moment, the piece was referred to as the Guggenheim Cup. Today, glassmakers are still at work and living on Murano, but once again are facing crisis and socio-political challenges. Like glassmakers everywhere, the struggle continues. My intention with this demonstration is to pay tribute to the artisans of Murano, both past and present, and those who have shared their passion so that their craft will continue. It is with great reverence and appreciation for Murano's craft heritage that I imitate and practice this art form that they have nurtured and honed through many ups and downs for the past thousand years. I hope you enjoy this presentation of the Guggenheim Cup, and thanks for tuning in. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Corning Museum of Glass, and to our demonstration, this is a very special demonstration. Uh, this is a, a demo that we call Bring the Heat, uh, and we call it that because it's a demonstration that features some of the museum's best professional artists. In this case, it's Jeff Mack. And it features some of our artists making some of their very favorite pieces. Um, and this demonstration is actually live streamed, so this will be something that folks at home are watching as we're making it. And in addition to that, this will live on on YouTube. So the museum has a very robust YouTube channel, lots and lots of subscribers, and uh, lots of folks watch video, videos like this to learn about the glass making process and even professional artists watch this to learn about specific techniques. Uh, the piece that Jeff is making this morning is called a Guggenheim cup. Uh, there's an example of it here on the, on the table. So this is a very, very elaborate uh, Venetian style uh, goblet. We call them goblets. I don't think it's really something that you know you'd want to take to the to the wineries up on the Finger Lakes and do tastings with, um, but but it is a stylized wine glass, and this is based on a couple of historical precedents, and you can actually go up into our galleries and see an example of of this cup that was made uh, over a hundred years ago, actually probably nearly two hundred years ago on the island of Murano in Venice, and that cup was actually styled after a piece that was made during the golden age of the of Venetian glass, which was the 16th and 17th century. So this is kind of the, the third generation of a being inspired by an original piece that was made centuries ago. Um, and this is a piece that's known to challenge glassmakers over the year, years, and it's a, a very exciting piece to watch come together. Um, Jeff is getting started. One of the things about making a wine glass like this is that it's very elaborate, um, and you'll see as we go on the, in the process that it's not just assembled from bottom to top. You make different elements, and the, the, then those elements come together. The piece compounds and compounds and gets bigger and bigger um, until we wind up with a cup like this. Uh, and obviously, the, the lid here is a separate piece. We'll also be making one of these lids today. So all in all, this object will take about two hours to make, and as I mentioned to some of you, you're certainly welcome to sit here for the whole process. We'd love, love for you to stay. Um, or you can, you can go up, look around, come back, maybe even go check out the, the real Guggenheim Cup that the museum has in our collection and come back and, and see how we're doing. Um, so your visit is up to you, and, uh, and we certainly hope that you enjoy this 
demonstration of, of some real artistry in glass. Jeff has been making glass for a long time now, uh, over 25 years. And this is really his area of focus. Uh, every glassmaker, as they evolve in their, in their learning, sort of focus on different things. And Jeff, throughout his career, has focused on Venetian-style glass, um, you know, and in in especially the very thin, delicate wine glasses like this. A lot of times when you say Venetian-style glass to some people, they'll think of thick, heavy, aquatic sculptures or chandelier. There's lots of different sorts of glass that are made in Venice and on the island of Murano. Um, but these goblets, if you ask a glassmaker, the, you know, the, when you say Venetian-style glass, a lot of glass blowers think of goblets and wine glasses like this. So as Jeff makes components for this, uh, he'll be placing them, he'll be parking them in a piece of equipment that we call the garage. So we'll start with a little tour of the shop. All the way over on your right side there, there's a, a little, a little gas-fired oven. You can see a, a, a dull orange glow in there. And that little gas oven runs at around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit is relatively cool in the glass making process. The glass that Jeff just gathered out of the furnace here is around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So when we're making a piece of glass, we work within that range, basically, from 1,000 degrees to 2,000 degrees. The reason we put the foot in the garage over here at 1,000 degrees is, if, is because if it cools below 1,000 degrees, it will crack. And so we have to keep it uh, above 1,000 degrees the entire time we're working through this process to prevent it from breaking, to prevent the whole thing from breaking. There's a good way that you'll know that this goblet is over 1,000 degrees as Jeff is working on it. The way that you know is that it's still in one piece. So if you see things starting to break and fall apart and go tink, tink, that just means it's getting too cold. So as we work across the stage here, Jeff right now is in a reheating furnace, and we call this the glory hole, and you can actually see inside of the furnace on our monitors up here. Uh, and we use that glory hole to keep the glass very hot, to keep it malleable and soft, and sometimes just to prevent it from cracking or breaking. And then the last major piece of equipment we have here is our glass melting furnace, and I'll refer to that here in a minute as Jeff gathers glass once again to, to prepare another component. So Jeff has just um, gathered some glass. He coated it in gold foil, so it's fancy. And now he's working on, on creating sort of the, the base structure for this cup, which are these gold balls. There are four of them right through there. We call those gold knops. And so one of the first things he has to do is create that core structure. So he's going to be working on developing four little golden balls that will comprise the core of the stem. Now, you may have noticed um, that Jeff is wearing a mask, just like all of us, right? And we are glass blowers. This is a piece of blown glass. The, the balls and the stem of this are hollow. The foot that they just uh, made was made from a hollow glass bubble, but we're not blowing through the blowpipe like we typically would. So one of the things that happened as soon as, as soon as we understood what it meant to live in the time of COVID is that our technician got to work on a new device to inflate glass with compressed air. And so you'll see Katie over there is holding a sort of a surgical rubber tube that's attached to the blowpipe. And Jeff actually uses a little foot pedal, just like this one. Um, and he steps on that foot pedal, pedal when he wants to introduce air into the pipe. The foot pedal is attached via a little solenoid valve to some regulated air pressure. And when you tap that pedal, it opens the valve and air goes into the pipe. So, like I said, when we, when we first knew we were going to be wearing masks or when we came back to work, um, we developed this tool right away. And the museum opened on July 1st. And starting July 1st, we had to become accustomed to using a new uh, a new device in blowing glass. So as I said, Jeff has blown glass for 25 years. And 
I basically had to re relearn how to do it. so that we were able to stay safe and keep each other safe. So with those golden balls, you'll notice maybe on the stem there that they're separated a little bit by some space. And so once Jeff forms those little golden knops, we actually have to separate them and we'll be putting them back together. So one of the things I know Jeff has enjoyed about this piece is that um, he was one of the first glassmakers in the United States to attempt to make it. And what that meant is he had to, he had to unlock the puzzle of how it was assembled, right? So that's nothing that comes in a manual. You can't, you can't Google search Guggenheim goblet. Well, you, you will be after this. You'll be able to do that after this because we're going to put it on the internet. But when Jeff started to do this, he couldn't Google search Guggenheim cup and learn the steps of the process to make it. There was no step-by-step -step guide. And so I know for Jeff, one of the fun things about making this cup was seeking out examples that he could find here at the Corning Museum of Glass and, and on Murano, and then analyzing it and imagining the steps in the process to put it together. So it's definitely like a little puzzle. And uh, he really did a remarkable job. And I know since Jeff has done this, there are a number of other glassmakers who actually have the hand skills to do it, who have really studied the way Jeff puts this together so that they could attempt to make it as well. But again, it's not, a, it's not just a cut and dried process. No, not every glassmaker can look at one of these and say, oh yeah, so they, you know, they make the four gold balls and then they separate them and put them back together and do these bits and yeah. So it was really a, a fun little riddle to figure out. Helping out in the process today is Katie Hubbs here. Uh, Katie's a glassmaker who's worked with us uh, for an, a couple of years now and uh, as important as <laughs> hi Katie, as important as it is for Jeff um, to know what he's doing, it's nearly just as important for Jeff to be able to trust his assistant. So Jeff and Katie have uh, collaborated and made a couple of these already together, and and it's really a process for the two of them to get on the same page and to get their timing down. Um, because the, the timing really has to be on. It's like, it's like a song, you know, if the song is going too fast or if, or if the guitar is playing at a different tempo than the drummer, then it's going to sound horrible. And glass making is really the same way. So if Katie is sort of running to her own time and Jeff is expecting something different, it's just not going to turn out. So it's, it's really important that the two of them have developed their process of working together especially on something as fine and as detailed as this, uh, so that Jeff doesn't have to worry about it. Basically, there's so much to focus on in making the piece itself that the last thing Jeff wants to have to do is to worry that Katie is going to bring the bit too hot or if she's going to bring it too late um, or too cold. Just like the, like the three bears, it has to be just right. All that talk about being on the same page, I still have to ask, because I, I'm part of this too. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help out on key moments when you actually need six hands and not just four. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm on the same page too. I forgot to mention, but as we go along, if any of you have questions, just wave at me. We'll, we're happy to make this a conversation and, and to, to take questions. This is just a crystal clear object. I'll cover one of the basics, and that is a glass is made mostly of pure silica sand. Nice, pure sand gives you clear glass. The Venetians uh, were the first to make Cristallo. So they called their clear glass Cristallo, basically after rock crystal. Rock cr crystal is, is nice and clear like that. But the Venetian Cristallo 
It was really one of the first times they made really nice, clear glass. If you look at the oldest glass in the museum, look at the Roman glass, very little of it is clear. And if it does happen to look kind of clear, it was probably more, than, more of an accident than, than intention. Um, there are a lot of impurities present in the silica that's used to make glass, a lot of impurities present naturally that tend to tint the glass, either bluish or greenish or maybe kind of yellow or ambery. So it actually took a while for glass makers, and by a while I mean thousands of years, for glass makers to figure out how to make glass reliably clear. And it has to do with the purity of ingredients. And then some of the, not, not just the main ingredient, not just the silica, but some of the other ingredients that go into making glass. Glass is made of sand, uh, some fluxing agent, soda ash or pot ash, and limestone, uh, calcium carbonate. Those are the three main ingredients in making glass. And then trace ingredients, um, things like colorants or decolorants, uh, things to stabilize the glass over time. The glass is made primarily of sand. And, and you can melt sand that you'd find on a beach and make glass out of it. Um, just wouldn't really be a nice glass to work or to make things out of. You really need to find that pure source of silicon dioxide or crushed quartz to make really nice glass. So again, a lot of this work is going to be very fine details. Um, we're mixing, mixing the, the video up in the booth here. So we have a booth operator, Jason's up in the booth, getting you a good view from your seats on these big monitors. Um, if you've just come in, I'm also going to invite everyone down to come and take a closer look at this, uh, an example of the piece that Jeff is making at some point, so you can see some of the detail. I'm going to hop in and help out a little bit here. So this, this golden knob was relaxing over here in the 1,000 degree oven. Go ahead, Katie. We're just going to bring it out. I'm going to give it a little extra, little extra something in the reheating furnace there. So that when Jeff touches it with his tool there, it doesn't crack. Sometimes something as benign seeming as touching, touching the glass with a steel tool can cause it to crack. So the steel tool can be cool enough relative to the glass that it would cause the glass to break. So they're going to go through this step a few times. They're going to knock this one off. 
onto that same paddle, put it back in the garage, and then he's going to add those bits to the next gold ball. And then they place it into the garage, and that garage is going to keep the glass nice and hot. Um, while they're working on the next piece, then they'll pull that out, stick it back on, until we build, until he builds up the whole stem. So they add these little ribbons. Oh, this isn't a ribbon yet. This is just a little bit of glass on the tip of that. So now they'll add the ribbons. We stick it on, he cuts it free. He'll squeeze it with the tweezers. We'll kind of flatten it out. And then by spinning it fast, it will pull and stretch out. And then he can pull and stretch it out quite a ways. Now it goes from a very soft material that he can pull and stretch to a material that gets very rigid in about at this size, about you know five seconds, it goes from gooey to stiff. And so he has to work very quickly um, because that glass cools so quickly. So with these goblets and this Venetian style work, timing is everything. There's no time to sit and look at the glass and decide what's next, you kind of have to quickly make moves because the glass cools so quickly. So he let her know to get the next one. And they'll add three of these. So each one of these, each one of these little knobs has has three little loop handles on it, and then Jeff puts uh, on each of those handles he puts two little raspberries, uh, just because that's the way the original was. It has a little a little decorative raspberry on it. So this is a third of those three little handles, and then after the the four knob sem stem is reassembled where part of that will be adding adding chain the chain bits that go down the side of these so there are these these fancy little zigzag chain bits um, that, that go down the side of it so those are really probably the trickiest uh, technical or hand skill part of doing this is applying those those chain bits Again, all the back and forth to the reheating furnace 
is just to make sure that the heat is maintained, that that, that whole thing stays above 1,000 degrees all of the time so that it doesn't crack. It's a, a lot of work to accomplish this piece. And part of, part of learning to do it is just learning the, the timing and getting the getting the innate sense of when, when you need to reheat. Um, when you're starting to blow glass, everybody asks, well, how many seconds do I need to reheat it and how many minutes can I take, stay out of the heat? Well, the, the, there's really no simple answer to that because there's so many variables in what you're making, you know, how thick the glass is, how hot it was when you began, that you really just can't say, well, you need, to, you need to reheat it for five seconds and then you can stay out for 25 seconds because if the glass is really thin or delicate, um, that probably isn't true. If the glass is very thick and heavy, uh, that probably isn't true. So it's really a matter of developing a, a, a sense of timing through experience, through making the same piece over and over again uh, in understanding how, how long, how frequently you need to reheat something to keep it in the right temperature range. I did want to make sure that I welcomed our online viewers. This is a, uh, an object that will be, become part of our YouTube video library. Uh, Jeff Mack and Katie Hubbs working on making what we call a Guggenheim cup or what is called the, a Guggenheim cup. Um, Jeff was saying before we began that this is called a Guggenheim cup because there was a glass collector in Venice um, who challenged the makers on the island, who found the historical object, and then he challenged the makers on the island to replicate that historical object. And this was uh, back in the, in the 19th century. And ever since then, it's been known as the Guggenheim Cup. Michelangelo Guggenheim, an art dealer, now, Jeff, do you know if he was related to, to Peggy Guggenheim? The, I don't know. The, there's that Guggenheim Museum in Venice. That might have been the other Guggenheims in Venice. I don't know. There's so many of them. So uh, Jeff recorded a little introduction to this piece that will be on the YouTube channel. And in the introduction, um, Jeff wanted to say that, you know, creating this object, recreating this object is really a, um, uh, it's really with all respect to the, the history and tradition of, of Venetian glassmaking. And uh, he really wanted to make sure that he paid homage to the thousand, over thousand year uninterrupted history of glassmaking on Venice. And, and really, glassmakers in the United States wouldn't be working this way today if it weren't for a few brave, uh, adventurous glassmakers from the island of Murano who started to come to the United States in the late 80s and early 90s and teach American glassmakers how to make glass properly. Um, it's kind of a crude way of putting it, but there was uh, a lot of glassmakers in the United States who were making glass in small studios and at universities and they were doing a well enough job. You know, there was a history of glassmaking in the United States, but it was most re mostly industrial, in including here in Corning. There were glassmakers in Corning for the last 150 years, um, but they were working in a factory across the river. There was a big factory here in Corning across the river until 1982. And those glassmakers working in the factories over there, they weren't making things like this. You know, they were making, they were making big, uh, big acid jars out of Pyrex, you know, they were making things that didn't require a lot of uh, the same sort of finesse. And so a lot of American glassmakers were, were sort of trained by factory glassmakers who were about speed of production um, and not so much about the finesse or the detail of work. And so really in the 1980s and late 80s and early 90s, a couple of glassmakers coming over who were trained to make objects that took more time, uh, took a little more skill. And I, I say that again in a respectful way. Um, the Venetian skill was different in that they made a lot of things offhand, where factory workers in the United States were blowing a glass in molds predominantly. So if you blow a glass into a mold, you, get, you bring it out and you have the shape of a bottle or you have the shape of, of a, 
of a pitcher or whatever, but Venetian glassmakers, by and large, were forming things offhand, so they had a, a different, different way of work and a different set of hand skills. So it's definitely a lineage from that that have allowed Jeff to pursue this as his personal passion uh, without gl the glassmakers like Lino Talia Pietra coming over to the United States. Um, glassmakers here just wouldn't have the, the fundamental um, skills in this type of work to, to accomplish something like this. A lot of people here at the museum ask us if glassmaking is a dying art, and, and you know, obviously there are pressures um, for artists to, today that make this a lifestyle that isn't easy to pursue, but there still are a lot of people who make glass by hand and make a living making glass by hand. So if you buy a, a unique piece of glass in the gift market here or in a craft fair um, or in a gallery, you know, you're definitely supporting an artist who's following their passion. Just like if you go see live music or see a concert or go watch a, a performance of dance, you know, it's always great to see artisans pursuing their passion and putting their life's work into something creative. The museum supports living artists in a lot of ways. Obviously, many of them make it into the collection here. Uh, the Corny Museum of Glass has one of the premier schools for learning glassmaking techniques in the country. We have a, uh, just across this, the parking lot here, we have a place called The Studio, where glass artists from all over the world come to take classes and to learn from professional glass artists. Jeff and I both first came to Corning to take classes over at the studio. So um, we, we're all of the glassmakers here, we're all transplants to Corning. We've, we wound up making this our home because there's so much, this is such a great place for glassmakers to live. Um, but we came here from, from out of state initially just to take classes and to learn from the collection of the museum. So this is the fourth, fourth ball of the stem, the fourth golden ball of the stem. We've got three of them in the oven there with the, those three handles on each of them and the six little raspberries on each of them. And after Jeff gets this together, we're going to start reassembling them and then putting on the, the chain bits. Again, these are the little raspberries. You, you, might, you might notice, one, one of the thing that, things that's impressive for glassmakers when they watch someone do something like this is when you're learning to make glass, it seems like the glass is always too cold. Like it's too cold and too hard to shape. And when you're watching someone like Jeff make something like this, one of the things that's hard to understand without knowing a little bit about glass is, is how quickly you have to work to, to accomplish what you want to accomplish because these thin little threads of glass cool down really quickly and as they cool, they become very rigid. So Jeff is, is working to a tempo, but he's not rushing. And, and again, that's, that's a very fine line. If you hurry through the process, you're prone to making mistakes, but you have to work with great deliberacy, you have to be very deliberate about what you're doing uh, to, do, to accomplish everything that you need to accomplish when you're working on something um, that has a lot of fiddly little bits on it like this piece does. I've seen Jeff make a number of these. I, in his career, he's probably made, I don't know, 50, 60 of, of this particular piece. And, 
and it's always it's always to the design of the original. Like some some artists, you know, they'll take an original and they'll immediately put their own spin on it. Some artists really like to to stick to a traditional design. A lot of the people that Jeff has learned from are very traditional Venetian glassmakers and and the Venetian glassmakers that Jeff has learned from will say that's not how it's done. If you if you make this piece and you don't put raspberries on it, they'll say, well, it's not right. <laughs> and so I, I think it's great that Jeff respects the tradition and sticks to that design. So Jeff, are we we're putting the double set on this next? No, the single. The single, okay. 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 So part of my job is to think ahead and get the next component ready to serve up as part of the reassembly process of this piece. So this garage over here where, where the components are parked, um, the burner is over on one side, the burner is over on the left side. So the longer something stays in there, you want to keep it over on the right side, which is a little cooler, and then as you as you get close to bringing it back out of that furnace, out of that little oven, you want to sneak it over to the left side to get a little more of that heat in it. You want to get it to the point where it's just starting to soften so that it doesn't crack when it comes out. So again, for everybody here, um, I, I just wanted to reiterate that this is a this is a two hour piece, and we're about we're about. 30 minutes into it, 30 or 40 minutes into it. So you're certainly welcome to, to stay for the whole thing or come and go as you like. Uh, it gets, yep, it gets really exciting at the end when we put all of these bits together to make that amazing goblet. So, reassembling now. We stick that together with what we call a glue bit. It's just a, a dab of molten glass that will stick the two knobs together. There's just so much to pay attention to, you know, as he puts those back together, he wants to make sure that that, that joint that's buried down in there, way down in there, isn't distracting because it's a big, ugly gob glob of glass. You want to use enough glass that it sticks together, but not so much glass that it squishes out everywhere. You want to get it nice and, nice and centered. You want it to run on a central axis, so it's easy to get it camshaft off to one side or the other. Um, and you want the bits to line up, right? So he's put those three handles on there. And you want those to line up, so it's easy to have it twisted a little bit. 
So again, when it all goes, when it all goes together well, it looks easy. Um, but it's, it's so easy to screw it up. There's so many things that you could do wrong. Anybody have any questions? Probably our most frequent question is how do you get color in glass? You'll see, again, objects in the museum here that are nearly 4,000 years old. And the oldest pieces of glass in the museum are colored. Color is made by introducing or by the, the inclusion of metallic compounds in the glass. Things like copper and iron and cobalt. Jason's getting a great shot there of, of this delicate bit. A scroll bit that, that is linking a scroll or a chain bit that is linking all of these four components together. And this is, this is, again, another case where um, you could take a glass blower who's been making glass for 40 years and tell them to do a bit like that, and they'd laugh at you. <laughs> they'd say, no way. Um, it's something that really, again, Jeff doesn't look like he's rushing, but you have to be so deliberate because that glass is so thin and it cools off so quickly and becomes rigid that you, you just have to have the bit delivered at the perfect temperature and the perfect time, and then really work through that process with great focus to get it to work out. And that was one of a dozen of these chain bit, that scroll bits that Jeff's gonna be making. Would you guys drink your orange juice out of this in the morning? Your fancy orange juice glass? <laughs> maybe uh, maybe for one day, yeah, or one sip. With my kids, it would be one sip. Scroll bit number two. Oops, there you go. It's always good to see what can go wrong, right? That one got a little cold and Popped right off of there. Right. It's okay when that happens now. It's not okay when you're putting the whole thing together and you start seeing bits hop off because they've gotten too cold. So. That's a case of no harm, no foul. We'll just do the next one, and that's fine. There's a point in the process where that would have been a little disastrous, though. But fortunately, not right now. Katie and Jeff are really working together on this one. Katie feeds. You want to keep the glass close to the, the delivery iron so that it stays hot. That steel actually keeps the glass warm, and so as they're going along, Katie draws it away and sort of gives Jeff more material to make, to make that scroll. So this, uh, I, I think you've all heard me mention this, this, um, this demonstration was supposed to be live streamed, but apparently there's an internet outage in the region right now. Uh, I got word from home where my, where my son is, is attending school from our kitchen table that there's no internet there either. Uh, so this was supposed to be a live streamed uh, demonstration, um, but it's not, but we are going to put this on YouTube and so you can, you can go back home and relive your experience at the museum and uh, check this out on YouTube. Um, but it's, it's really a great resource for, for people who love glass and for artists working in glass to be able to see Jeff create this piece. Um, and it'll be great to have that on, on the, the YouTube channel. 
I just wanted to, to say to, to folks who might be tuning into this that we are doing a series of, of artist demonstration live streams, and we're doing that every, every Wednesday. And the fun thing is, is that on some Wednesdays, it's our own artists, and on other Wednesdays, we're inviting, uh, we're inviting people to submit drawings that our glassmakers will then we, we will recreate. So we do a program called You Design It, We Make It. We've done that here at the museum for, for many, many years now, where we've always invited museum guests to do drawings, and then our glassmakers select one drawing, and they'll, they'll make it. Um, but because of the times we're in, we decided to take that virtual, and now we're having a virtual You Design It, We Make It every other week where our glassmakers will be selecting a drawing that has been submitted online on our website and then creating it for our live stream. So we're really excited to be able to open up our You Design It, We Make It process to really to the world by allowing people from anywhere to do a drawing, to do a little write-up about it, tell us about their idea, and then... Yep, you got it. And then uh, to tune in to see if their drawing is selected. Actually, we, we let the selected artist know a couple of days in advance so that they can either come here to the museum and watch the piece being made or tune in from home and see it being made. Yep. Sorry. There we go. We did, we've done one You Design It, We Make It already, uh, one virtual You Design It, We Make It. And, uh, and I think it was a great success. Do you guys think that was a great success, the You Design It, We Make It? These guys, this is actually our first artist from our You Design It program last week who made a, a wonderful, can I call it a scarecrow, is that what it was? Yep, that our glassmakers made. And that actually is on, on YouTube now. And, they came to meet the glassmakers and pick up the piece. The other good thing about that program is that the designer gets to keep, um, keep the object when it comes out of the oven. All right, so back to scroll work. So scrolls on top of scrolls. Jeff's actually assembling this differently than he's done in the past. So um, again, I talked earlier about unlocking the puzzle of, of how this piece was done. And Jeff was always refining the process. When Katie gathers out of the furnace there, she's dipping into a pool of about a thousand pounds of glass and just gathering the glass out of there like you'd gather honey on a, on a straw or a chopstick. And as long as you keep the, the iron turning, keeping the, the rod turning, keeps it on the pipe. If uh, Katie stops turning, then the glass drips off the floor. You can see that when she comes over to get the right amount of glass 
in the right heat profile, Jeff has Katie gather plenty of glass and then they strip a little bit of it off when she comes over to the bench. Again, things got a little chilly there and snipped off, but uh, we're still in a good place for that to happen. So as Jeff is assembling this stem, keeping the whole thing concentric requires a lot of, a lot of tweaking now and then to make sure that everything stays straight. One of the things I love about working in this studio, well, I love everything about working in this studio. This is a wonderful studio, but uh, is just the view that you get here. When w one of the details of this piece that's easy to overlook is the, the profile of that bit that Jeff is attaching right now. Uh, on the original, it actually is kind of, um, it's almost like two strands of glass woven together. And the way that Jeff achieves that look is by stripping the glass off of the iron when Katie brings it over with a pair of diamond shears and kind of digging the, the tips of those diamond shears into the bit. And it creates a profile on that scroll bit that's very authentic to the original. And it's neat that we're able to see that on, the, on these great high definition cameras. It's wonderful that at the museum we're able to produce content for our YouTube channel like this and it, it's really due to the wonderful infrastructure and the amazingly talented people that we have behind the cameras to get the high high quality video and to to mix it and then to edit and put things up on YouTube it's a it's a real effort and it's easy to overlook that but i always want to call out the efforts of the team that put together the wonderful content that we have on our YouTube channel i'm i'm sure that's a big part of why it's so popular Jeff was just saying that, um, he probably doesn't want me to say this, but um, they're gonna have to do a little repair. Right now, if you watch him, when he attaches that first, he pulls up a little lug right there. And one of those broke off. And he said, well, that's kind of my K2 
canary in the coal mine. That's the, the thing that tells me if it's getting too cold is if one of those breaks off. And he, he can put another little bit of glass on there and, and repair that. But he's just saying it's one of the telltale ways that he has of knowing where he stands with the temperature of the stem as he's working on it. It is certainly a beautiful day in upstate New York. I'm sorry, you're probably watching from home and you may not be watching in late September, but it is just a gorgeous fall day here in upstate New York. I think if you ask anybody who lives in Corning what their favorite season is, nine times out of 10, you're gonna hear fall because it's just so pretty around here and today's a, a picture perfect fall day. We have a view out of the amphitheater here of some, some lovely yellow leaves and gentle breeze, leaves fluttering down. Good morning, folks. You might think I'm talking to nobody up here, um, but we're, we're live streaming this. Actually, we would be live streaming this right now, but there's a little issue with the internet. So we're, we're recording the creation of this object for our YouTube uh, channel that we'll put up as sort of an educational tool. Um, so I'm gonna start by just saying what Jeff is working on. This is our master glass maker. His name's Jeff Mack, and he's making one of these, which is a, a replica of a Venetian piece that's called the Guggenheim Cup. There's one over there also you can take a close look at if you want to see the detail of it. And so right now Jeff is working on making, making the fancy stem. This is the fanciest of fancy stems, right? <laughs> and so he's, um, he's a good way into making the detail of that stem. So again, this is a piece, we actually have one of these in our, in our museum collection that was made in the 1800s. And Jeff was inspired by that. It's one of the great things of working here at the museum is you can see things in the collection and then you can give it a shot yourself. And this is a particular piece that's renowned for being a, a real technical challenge. And so uh, Jeff wanted to make one of these today. And so we're, we're about an hour into it and it's about a two hour piece. So you're, you're welcome to stay and watch him complete it if you want, but you certainly don't have to. You have to. <laughs> Is there pizza? You know what? That's a great question. I wish there was pizza delivered here. There, of course, there is pizza in our cafe. There, pizza actually isn't too bad. Um, but maybe if he's successful, we'll, we'll order a couple of pies in celebration. <laughs> now, this, this top piece of the cup as well is the ball? Yep, yep. Yeah, and then it, this, isn't, this is made subsequently, not, not right during, but you, I mean, the, the original had, had a, a lid like that, so. Yeah, so he's, he's already made the foot, and the foot is over there. You, you can actually see it right through that door there. Um, so the foot is done. The last thing he'll make is the cup, and then we'll assemble the whole thing. And then you can take it up to, you know, Dr. Frank's or Bully Hill and, and do some wine tastings. Are you? Nice. Are you going up on Seneca or over on Cuca Lake? Uh, Dr. Frank's is, is the standard. It's very reliable, really, really good. Um, obviously, mostly dry whites, um, but, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's my, my go-to. Yeah, as I was saying,
to the folks watching on YouTube, it's a beautiful fall day here in upstate New York, and one of the things that makes living here just so wonderful, in addition to beautiful falls, are the Finger Lakes and all the wonderful vineyards around there, renowned for making great white wines. Yeah. And better and better red wines, too, I'll have to say. So really one of the, the country's great wine regions. Just a half hour drive here from Corning. Okay. Is that coming off now? Yeah. You good? All right, so Jeff is just checking the, that everything on that stem is nice and warm, nice and toasty warm, as one of my colleagues always used to say, toasty warm glass. And then that's going to come off, and it will go to rest in the garage for a little bit uh, while Jeff works on the next component, which will be the cup. There we go. So nice little tap. Off it comes and into the garage. So again, we um, were able to use this little oven over here. That oven is around 1,000 degrees on the hottest side. The burner is on one side, so it's all the way over on the left. Um, so the hot side is over 1,000 degrees. The cooler side is around 900 degrees or so. So if you want to let something sit in there a long time, you put it on the right side, and as, it, as you're approaching bringing it back out to assemble this, you sneak it over to the left side. At around 1,000 degrees or 1,200 degrees, the glass will very, very slowly start to soften. It, um, it doesn't melt. Glass doesn't have a melting point. It just starts to soften. And so you want to bring it over to the warmer side where it starts to soften. Um, so the next part will be for Jeff to make the cup on this and then to, to put it all back together. So a little bit more to do. He's just going to grab a drink of water, and then we'll get started on putting it all together. Where are you guys visiting from? Oh, OK, good. Not too far from home, then. Well, thanks for making the trip today. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you'll love it up at the lakes if you haven't been. So one of the interesting things about this time, you see, just like you guys, we're wearing masks too, and the, the cup on this is a, is a piece of blown glass. And so on each of the benches, we've come up with a, a little system of inflating the glass without using, a, without using our mouth. Um, we're using uh, a swivel attachment and a hose, and then we have a little foot pedal here and it goes through these series of valves and regulators to give us just the right amount of pressure and the right amount of volume of air to blow glass. One of the things through this whole process of learning how to work in COVID that we've realized is, is how really good people are at blowing glass because it's surprisingly difficult to create an apparatus that gives you the right volume and the right pressure of air to inflate glass. So there you can see Jeff tap, tapping away with his foot and there, the bubble is introduced into the glass. Exactly. Yep. You know, it really, it's a, yeah, it, it, it feels numb, you know, not to be able to get the, to articulate the pressure with your, with your mouth and your experience. Um, but, you know, we've adapted. A lot of the glassmakers who are using the foot pedal now prefer it for some things. Um, but it's certainly been an adaptation for us, and, uh, and honestly, an adaptation for glass studios around the country. Um, a lot of people have developed new ways of working, um, just like everyone else in every other industry, uh, now that we have this reality for a while. 
but the you know we're fortunate to be able to to still work um, and we certainly want to focus on keeping our glassmakers safe um, even in the best of times people would question how hygienic it was for every glassmaker to blow through at the end of a pipe without a whole lot of regard of cleaning the pipes in between demonstrations so I suppose this is a change for the good Really, it's, it's about a pound of air pressure. It's, it's very, very little air pressure that goes into the pipe. This one's actually set, yeah, set well below a pound of pressure. So when you blow glass, you don't have to, it's not like blowing up a rubber balloon. It's much, much easier. So to, to make this cup, um, this, is, this is, again, patterned after a Venetian piece. And the, the decoration on the bottom here is called mezzastampo. So it's a half molded cup. And to create that, the molded bottom, Katie's gonna bring a, a gob of glass over and they'll let it drip onto the bottom of this. And Jeff will stamp that down into a mold to give it a texture. <clears throat> so spool a little more material on there. and then right down into the mold here. These are little bronze molds. These are, I think those might be molds from Murano. A lot of the tools that we use, there are a couple of different makers of glass making hand tools around the world. Uh, there's one tool maker in Seattle. There's one guy in California that makes nice shears. Uh, there's a glass tool maker on Murano, and then there's a, a guy in Japan that makes really nice glass making tools. So there's really only a handful of places around the world where you can get good hand tools for glass making. It's not like uh, Black & Decker or Milwaukee make tools for glass blowers. They're really very specialized tools. How are you feeling, Jeff? Is it going well? Yeah, yeah. Good. So far, so good. So now that Jeff has a stamp on the bottom, he's, uh, he's snipping it again because that's traditional. Um, there's a little decorative line that he'll add, and then we'll be inflating this and opening it up. Jeff, have you ever seen any of the Venetian glassmakers that you've studied with make this piece or a piece like this? Uh, yep. Thing. Jeff uh, mentioned two glassmakers from Murano who he's learned from. Uh, a great man named Elio Quarisa who has passed away, but I know Jeff learned a lot from him, and so did I. He was a great Venetian glassmaker that would come to Corning for years, every winter and every summer, and had a, a loyal following of glassmakers who loved to learn from Elio. When did Elio pass away now? In 2011. Wow, time flies. Uh, and then there's another great stemware maker from the island of Murano named Davide Fuin, who's come to the United States many times. He offers classes at his home studio in Murano, and a lot of glassmakers travel there to learn from him. So Elio and Davide certainly paved the way for, for Jeff 
and a lot of glassmakers like Jeff to create work in this style. And I'm sure Elio and Davide would both say, you know, that their, their skills were built on the generations before them. That's one of the great things about Murano's and the, and the traditions there, that it was a centuries-long history of glassmaking and a passing of knowledge. Of course, today, Murano, like, like a lot of places, is under a lot of pressure. Um, under a lot of pressure even before COVID, but certainly now with reduced tourism and their, the dependence on a place like Venice and Murano on, on tourists from around the world. You can actually see Jeff using that foot modulated inflator to blow glass as he's shaping it and keeping it straight. You just see that puff up a little bit. Katie's going to bring over a glass for a racing stripe for a little decorative accent on the piece. Just touch on a little thread of glass there and run it around. And then Jeff will continue to inflate this, clean up the bottom. You can see the bottom is kind of pointy. Where he's pulling right there is going to be the bottom of the cup when we're through. Again, he's inflating it a little bit as he's working. All right, so the, the cup is inflated. Now they're going to be adding the, the joining bit on the bottom, the ovolio. actually getting relatively close to assembling this whole piece. So the, the order of business from here is that this cup will be puntied, so we'll transfer it from the blowpipe onto a finishing rod and flare it open. From there, the cup will be transferred onto another finishing iron that's deep inside of the cup, and then we'll attach the stem and attach the foot, and that's it. So 
getting relatively close. And then do the lid, of course. We're also going to be doing the lid, but for the cup, just a few more series of operations. I'm going to put on my thinking cap here because I'm going to have to help out for a little bit. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to, to Catherine Ayers to take us home. Catherine, over to you. I feel like the weatherman. Catherine, back to you. Jeff's going to need a little bit more help once they start putting all this together, and Eric's going to jump in and take the stem that's resting in the garage, attach it to the cup, and the foot. So we've got to com bring everything together at this point. So this is where the everything starts to come together. All the hard work is we've got the Stem already made, the foot's in the garage, and then the cup he's making now. Once he finishes that up, the whole thing can come together. Just going to puff up the glass there, making it nice and thin, nice and delicate. What's nice about these goblets is they are so thin and um, light. And so anything we can do, we can trim it, we can puff it up. But the idea is to make these pieces nice and thin, and very light. The tricky thing about working with glass when it's thin and light is that it cools off very quickly. So you're working, so the thinner you make something, the lighter you make something, the shorter that working time becomes. And so that can make it very tricky. You can see he goes back to the bench in one swift move. And if we weren't doing demonstrations here at the museum, he might scoot that bench right up closer to the, the hole. So he just marked a little circle on a piece of paper, I think. So he just set the hot glass on a little piece of paper and made a little burn mark. And then Katie, took a caliper reading of that little burn mark. There's a nice shot of that. Thanks, Jason. So he just burned the paper, and that's going to allow him to make a lid in the same day. Otherwise, you'd have to wait till that cup cooled off, then take a measurement. But he took a nice little measurement on some paper. So they're making an inside punty. 
Usually we put punty to the foot or the bottom of the piece, but this punty is going to allow them to add the stem. So it's an inside punty. It's actually like a dirty punty. So she rolled it on the floor so it won't stick as much on the sides. They're going to do a little handoff. And he's going to make, every, make sure everything's running nice and straight. That's another tricky thing about making this goblet or stemware is keeping everything nice and straight as you're working. When you're working with glass, you got to keep the pipes turning, turning nice and evenly, turning in both directions helps with that. But making sure everything stays nice and centered can be very difficult. So they're going to add a little glue bit, a little bit of hot glass. Eric brings over the stem, and Jeff will stick it right into that hot, gooey glass. And they just break it free. Now, I hate talking about how delicate these connections are, but these, <laughs> these uh, connections are very delicate. Uh, you see he's very, he, you can't even hear him set the rail, the, the pipe down on the rail. He's very careful how he moves around. And that's something that comes with years and years of practice and experience, being able to move around so gently. So as he straightens out that stem, Eric's going to grab the foot out of the garage. So he's picked the foot up on a punty. So they both have a piece on a punty right now. So Eric's got the foot on the punty, but he's moving the foot over to the, the warmer side of the garage. So we keep the glass on the cooler side of the garage when it's just hanging out in there because we don't want it to slump or change shape. But before he comes out and goes into the 2100 degree oven, we have to warm it up a little bit on the hotter side. Then he's taking it for a couple quick flash heats. He'll make his way over to Jeff, Jeff's bench and hole. So glass making is all about timing, temperature, and teamwork. So because these two have worked together many, uh, many years and they've made these pieces, they kind of know the timing. And so they don't really need to communicate too much. Like Eric knows that he's adding this glue bit. I'm going to come over and be ready so he can stick this right on into that hot, gooey glass. And there is a beautiful connection. How about a big round of applause? A nice break off. That went very well. And now you can see why those temporary connections are so important that they're weak because they have to break them off pretty easily. Now he's got a lot of weight off the end of the punty here. Eric's going to help him out by s with a little paddle. They're going to make sure the foot will hold this piece up nice and straight. And Katie's standing by. It's always nice just to stand by because things can happen pretty quickly in a hot shop. She's standing by with the forks. And the forks are what she's going to catch this goblet with. And this is going to go into a slow cooling oven. So when it's finished, when he's finished working on it today, we're going to put it into a slow cooling oven called an annealing oven. So every piece of glass that's ever made this way had to cool slowly overnight. 
or for a period of time. All right, so they've got everything running nice and even. Katie's going to heat up those forks. We don't even want to touch the glass with anything cold. So that's why she's heating up those forks. Because if you touch the glass with anything cold at this point, it could cause it to crack and break. Putting all the final touches. That's a beautiful goblet. A light tap. It pops right off. Katie's going to carefully and quickly get this into the slow cooling oven. And when we close this door, we're going to give them a big round of applause. Awesome. Nice job, Jeff. Beautiful. Great. So we've got, got a, a little bit of time left, so why not make the lid? So we'll be working on the lid next. See you, folks. Enjoy your visit. Thank you. So with the lid portion, um, the, the decorative part is pre-made and in the box. Uh, so Jeff will, be, uh, Jeff will be doing the, the blown part of the lid, and then we'll assemble the whole thing together here in the next. OK, great. So Jeff said that the one that we have in the, in the garage over here has been here for a while, so we may need to warm it up and tweak it, get it back on center. Yeah, it's a little tweaked. So we'll warm this up and work on it as Jeff is blowing out the, the lid portion. The lid's going to be a mezzo stampo as well. So just like the cup, we'll be adding the glass to the bottom pinching those ribs in there. You wouldn't want to have a Guggenheim cup without a lid. I mean, it just, it just wouldn't be right. I said that in jest, but it's actually true. It, it, it doesn't look right without the lid on it. It really, it really gives it the presence that it it deserves. Looks a little out of proportion with just that little cup up on the top there. And that great big stem. So it really is necessary to make that lid. So many components. Um, we were chatting before we began here. This has 90 individual gathers, uh, approximately, 90 individual gathers to make the piece. 90 trips to the furnace. Mostly Katie. Jeff just has to make a few. Katie makes 87 of them. Let's see, how many actually? Let's see. We've got the, no, so Katie would make 85 of them because Jeff gathers the, the, the gold balls, the foot, the cup, and the body of the lid. We have a very, very nice furnace here. It's a thousand pound melt furnace from Spiral Arts, an equipment manufacturer out in Seattle. It makes really wonderful equipment. And that 1,000 pound melt furnace is just so easy to gather out of. It has a switch on it so that when you open the door, it shuts the burner off so you don't get hot fingers. Well, it's still relatively hot gathering 2,000 degree glass, but but certainly the fact that the burner goes off when you open the door makes it more comfortable to gather out of. A 
again, just like the cup, the, the ribs on the mezzostampo and the lid are snipped as well. There's the same racing stripe on there. <laughs> Chewing through the glass. Is that a 12 or a 14? 14 ribs. This is based on designs and techniques from the, the golden age of Venetian glass, the 16th century, 17th century. Traditions that go back hundreds of years. Breaking new ground here, in all those years and centuries of tradition, nobody's ever done this wearing a mask, Jeff. Who knows? There have been other pandemics. It's really great that we've been able to adapt and to be able to be open and to work for our guests and for guests watching online while keeping each other safe. It's been an important part of everyone here feeling at ease at work to know that we're doing all we can to, to stay safe. Uh, got all kinds of protocols for cleaning the pipes and the way we work around each other. So we're happy it's all working out nicely. And that the museum has been open since July, July 1st. All right, so now you can see that filling out a little bit as Jeff steps on the foot pedal to introduce compressed air into the pipe. Auto puffer, the auto blower. We didn't invent the auto blower. There were a lot of glass artists who used uh, compressed air assisted blowing devices uh, even before wearing masks. It really helps when you're producing small repetitive things like Christmas ornaments. Um, but we gave it a lot of thought when we went into building our own here, and we really wanted to be able to modulate the, the air pressure to a very fine degree and control not just the pressure of the air, but also the volume of it coming out. And uh, really came up with a clever system that has worked well and that our team has really been able to adapt to pretty quickly. comes the, the stripe. Jeff snips that to a point, so we have a nice, delicate landing patch. And wraps it right around. Just like that. Oh, I forgot to mention, Jeff, no, this, I forgot to mention it because it's something we, we've never done before, really. Um, 
the, so the museum, you know, to to adapt to changing times and and to to really to allow our artists to explore the the market for work, work that we make. We're actually offering some of the pieces that we make on our on our live streams for sale, and I think Jeff has agreed through our shops to offer his Guggenheim cup for sale. And so if this is something that you'd like to have in your home, I know I would love to have one. Make sure you check online because it will be offered for sale. I can confidently say that you will have something that none of your friends have. If you, if you get one of these in your house, unless your friends are all glass blowers and they know Jeff or the handful of other people that can make these, there aren't a lot of these around. So it's a, it would be a fun thing to have in a collection. A very, very unique object that only a handful of people in the world can make. All right, so they're moving ahead with that. I'm going to I'm going to bring out the finial. And it's been resting in the garage here for close to 2 hours. So I'm going to bring out the finial and work on getting it back into shape, getting it concentric again so that we can attach it here and get everything nice and straight. Getting the fold on that lid just right is a, a tricky application of pressure from the jacks, the tool, the main tool of the glass maker there. Really takes a lot of, uh, takes a fine touch, a lot of finesse to get that on there nice, to get that nice fold in there like that. Now it's a matter of opening that up a little bit more and checking the size against, uh, if you have tuned in for the whole process here, you'll know that Jeff made a burn mark on a piece of paper with the lid. So the, the cup itself is still in the annealing oven, so we can't get a good caliper measure on it. So what Jeff does is he'll burn a piece of paper
with the diameter of the cup, and then we know the lid will fit in there. A warm welcome to everybody just joining us. Thank you for visiting the Corning Museum of Glass today. We're sort of on the tail end of a long project that we've been working on. Jeff Mack, the glassmaker over on the bench there on the, on the left side of the stage is our master glass blower, and he's completing a very special piece called the Guggenheim Cup. You can see we have an example here on the table of what Jeff has been making. Now, the bad news for you is that he's already completed the majority of the cup. So the, the goblet cup itself, the stem and the foot is already assembled. And what we're working on right now is finishing the lid, the very top part. And so we're just in the final stages of assembling this intricate, beautiful, piece. And again, for our guests who've just arrived, this is called the Guggenheim Cup. It's based on a, a cup made on the island of Murano hundreds of years ago. And it's called the Guggenheim Cup because there was an art dealer who found an example of this, and he challenged the glassmakers of Murano to replicate it. And of course, they took up that challenge, and many, of, many examples were made. Um, but it is definitely a challenging piece, a real example of glassmaking virtuosity. And Jeff has been inspired by that that story and the puzzle of creating the Guggenheim Cup, of figuring out how it was made, and then the challenge of making it. And it's been part of, the, part of his passion as a career glass artist to create his version of the Guggenheim Cup. Yeah, take your time, Jeff. Katie's helping Jeff uh, make sure that the, the size, so for folks who just walked in, when Jeff created the, the bottom portion of this goblet, he burnt a piece of paper as a way of knowing the size of the rim of the cup, and therefore knowing how big to make the lid. And so right now, Katie and Jeff are just checking that against the lid. So now that the lid is, has been sized, to attach the finial, we're going to have to rearrange it. We're going to have to attach the attach that lid to a finishing iron called the punty, and basically turn it all around. All right, and now that Jeff has done that, we'll commence the process of joining this finial that I have and the lid that Jeff has together.
So they just added those little hot bits of glass so they could stick this to the top or the lid. Hot glass is very sticky when it's hot. And a light tap, now it pops right off. Okay, so again, we just did the joint that transitions the finial here from the top. And now Jeff just has to add one finishing touch, a tiny little dab of glass to the very top. So a little bit of work on that. And this will be ready for, I don't know, maybe, maybe you could put uh, candy corn in there for Halloween. Nice. It's designed for candy corn. So it took just about an hour and 50 minutes to create this beautiful piece, and again, the, the cup is already done. It's in the oven over here. The final step is to detach this lid, just like that. And before that cools too much, Katie will get it over into our annealing oven. If you look quickly, you might see the other cup in there. And it's kind of hard to see back in there. Into the oven it goes. And we'll see that tomorrow after it's cooled down. Everyone, have a, bit, a big round of applause for Jeff Mack. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful piece of glass. An amazing demonstration. Uh, I'd like to thank, say thank you to all of our guests who have tuned in on YouTube. Um, thank you for coming to our YouTube channel, watching these very informative videos. Uh, we're going to be putting out a lot more content, doing more featured artist demonstration, bringing the heat and more you design it demonstrations uh, through the course of the fall and hopefully next spring. Uh, and so thank you all for tuning in. And everybody have a great day. Thanks for coming to the museum. <laughs>